Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so thank you for attending on this beautiful spring day in Knoxville. I guess some of you are not here in Knoxville, so you may not know that, but it is a gorgeous day here. Uh, here too in Oak Ridge. Okay, yep. Imagine anywhere in East Tennessee is probably a beautiful day. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Perfect. So today's agenda, we're going to go over a few um, CSS things that might help you with the homework assignment. Um, that's due uh, basically this evening. So if you look at where we are, we have a second web project due essentially this evening, uh, really tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. And we are kind of in the midpoint of talking about PHP right now. And today we're going to be talking about how we handle forms and do session management in PHP. If we finish early, I may start into the PHP interface to MySQL and regular expressions. I'm not sure um, if we'll get that far or not. And you'll see that your next assignment coming up is uh, basically it's going to be PHP, but just converting your SQL queries from Web Project One to PHP. Um, scripts that access the MySQL database. So lecture on April 8th, uh, Thursday will be instrumental in allowing you to complete web project uh, three. Actually today as well, um, some of the stuff that we're going to be going over will be instrumental to that. And then, uh, so the rest of the week is basically PHP and then we segue into JavaScript, which will be kind of the big final wrap-up push for the semester. So a couple of things I wanted to show you dealt with the navigation bar. So if we go and just take a quick look at our video, it shows the web interface interactions. In this video, I'm yeah, going to demo need, the web. Can you all still hear me? I just muted the sound because I don't want. Am I still? Oops, I can no. hear you. Yeah. Your email you can still, address? Yeah, you can still hear me. Good. Okay. So, what do I want to get? Okay. So, first thing you'll notice. Yeah. There we go. First thing you'll notice is this is not the drop down menu that would appear by default. Uh, I want an arrow here as well, it's missing. So um, if you don't know the trick for getting this arrow, you might end up wasting a lot of time. So I'm going to show you that trick. And then when you come down here and you hover over a outcome, it's supposed to turn a darker color of gray. So move. Uh, Dr. VZ, is it okay? I made it where if we selected it, like focused, then uh -huh. it turned to color. Is that fine too? Or you said hover? So um, it should start when you hover, uh, basically. So a second, trying to figure out where that. Hold on one second, okay? There then is sure. the main page. Uh, okay, so you can see if, you know, doesn't really show it very well. Okay. Yeah, okay. So basically, if you hover over one, of, if you kind of move in here, what I want to see is it turn to a 
dark gray background as well as when you select it. So it provides this interim feedback. You always want to provide interim feedback. So for example, when you go down a menu, this is interim feedback where you see whatever option being created. So the way that you can do these two things, so let me show you. First of all, will, will we get points off if it doesn't? A uh... couple of things. You can see this box here that does the, has an arrow. And then you can see here when I come over and hover, it turns gray. This isn't as important, but I wanted to show you how you can also uh, turn links different colors when you hover over them. Okay, so these are the two things I want to show you how you can kind of make a this when you hover over one of those lengths, you can turn it into this nice uh, light gray background and how you can turn this into an arrow. So if I just the way I did it with the first of all with the link is I embed it, the link, in a div. So you see here div id equals foo, then I embedded the link into the div, thus turning it into a block element, okay? Otherwise, a link is an inline element and it would be hard to get it to stretch across the entire width of this navigation uh, panel. So then in styling it, I made the width 200 pixels. That's not what you wanna do. You don't wanna hard code the width. You're, you'll probably be using some kind of flex or grid layout or um, perhaps an ordered list uh, with these, but don't hard code the width like I did. I'm just was doing it to show you how you could embed the link in a box in order to um, get the uh, background to, uh, to turn gray for you. And again, you don't need this border. It was just there to show you how far the uh, div extended here. So the key is this foo colon hover selector. And what it's a special selector in uh, CSS that tells you or tells CSS or the browser what you want to do when the uh, cursor is hovering over that element. In this case, it says, I want to turn the background color to light gray. So that is why when I come in here and I hover, as soon as in fact I enter, it turns gray. And one of um, you asked, is it okay to just wait until I make the selection in order to turn it gray? And the answer is no. You actually need to, as you move between items, you need to provide that feedback because interim feedback is really important. Otherwise, the person may not be aware that you're actually listening to them. So this so-called syntactic feedback lets them know that you're listening, that you're engaged, uh, that the computer is engaged. Otherwise, they may not know that you actually realize that you're in this menu. So I, in fact, uh, come over outcome three, right now it's paused, that's why it's not doing anything. But when you come over outcome three, I want it to turn a light gray, in addition to when you select it. Um, so uh, just and out of curiosity, not going to be a big deduction. It's not worth redoing it and resubmitting it now. Just do it for the final project. Um, basically, uh, the way this second project thing works is we try to be a bit more lenient with things and give you feedback and then give you um, uh, on the final assignment, we're more strict. Okay, I see a couple of you had questions and I disabled my. Um, sound. So if you could actually now, those of you, it looked like um, Samantha and Logan both had questions. 
I was just trying to alert you that you had it muted. Thank you. Yeah. Once I saw those uh, hand raises coming up, I knew that. Thank you. Um, Logan, question? Other people, questions? Yeah, I've got I, a I question. Just... Tom, go, go first. You've had a question for a while. <laughs> um, well, it, it, it's nothing big. It's just, and you kind of answered it. If we didn't do that, because for whatever reason, when I watched the video, I thought it was when you selected it. So I've already turned mine in for that extra early bonus. Right. It's not um, worth it. Like I said, we're going to be pretty lenient this time. Um, it, not super picky, you know. Um, so we'll be giving feedback. It's only when you start missing big stuff that we're going to take off major points for this one. So it's going to be the final assignment where you really have to worry about getting these details down. So don't sweat it um, for this first one. Don't don't resubmit. So, OK, and, and you don't care if we like fancied up the buttons, like change no. the colors or when you're going over just as long as it didn't have to match yours 100 percent. It's just you make it depends how different it is. Um, the thing is, is there are certain things that we like. I intentionally made it white on blue to make it a little more difficult. So, well, I, I did make it white on blue, but what I did is when you click it, it turns like green on black. Okay. Just to say that's that you good. clicked it. Yep, that's good. That's fine. Yep. As long as it's pretty close to what I did. The problem is, I'm not grading it. The TA is grading it, and it's hard for me to. For those of you who are fans of Star Trek, I can't give a mind meld with the uh, the Spock mind meld with the uh, uh, TA. So um, if it, you get um, a lot of points deducted, just let me know and I'll take a look, okay? Because okay. I don't want to discourage your creativity. All right, so, thank you. It sounds good. Other questions? Uh, I have one. Mm-hmm. So I know you said that um, it doesn't have to be 100%, but last night I was working on it and um, I'm just very curious to know how you made the text um, on this webpage look so good. Because mine, like if I don't mess with anything, it just kind of, the text looks wiry and not very good. But if I increase the font weight to like 600, it just, um, it, it, it looks like it's too bold. Okay, you mean like for the results and the assessment plan? Or? No, actually, I'm talking about like, please enter the number of students. So I think I was just using an Arial font with that, with okay. um, a certain font size. So it, the key, it's an Arial, I'm pretty sure it's an Arial font that I was using. Okay, A -R I, I did that as font. well. Um, as long as you did that, I, you should be okay. Um, I don't, don't think I did anything other than that with it. Okay. I was just wondering, cause I wanted mine to look like nice, like yours, but it, it was close, but it just, it looked different to me. Okay. If you want, you can send me your thing via Piazza post. I can take a look and see if I see anything obvious, but again, don't, delay if you you got the if you wanted to do the submission for the extra points don't delay submitting it submitting it and then I can just take a look and for the final project let you know if there's anything I see um actually this is start all this talk is starting to make me wonder about a piazza post I saw where you said where was it uh, God, hold on I'm sorry something about uh it says generally you use one or uh, not oh, crap Okay, that's not it. it. It's something to do. I got the gist I got from it was is you don't have to mimic my page exactly. It just has to have kind of like the functionality that's there. Is that well, true? No, it's got to be close to this. I, I no, it, it's got to be close to especially with the layout. It has to be close and with the it can't and the buttons and like these images. I told you how to do these images. I specifically showed you how to get white on red um, and how to turn the person icon blue. So you do need to be pretty close to this. I'm just not saying, I didn't give you like 
things that said there's 20 pixels, you know, between here and here, between the two numeric widgets. But I do want it pretty close. And the colors, I didn't tell you what exactly this blue was or exactly what this uh, white was on top. So that's what I mean by don't just slave endlessly trying to get it perfect, but I do want it pretty close um, to what you see here. Like if I have a light gray background and the outcome here is bold faced with the major bold face, I want it like that. So uh, just kind of like the, the, the trend, I guess you could call it of the page, but the colors and the, the, the particular look of a Dropbox it doesn't necessarily have to match 100% as long as the items are in place in the right order. Like, uh, does that make sense? It makes sense, but yeah, they, I mean, like, I want this kind of, I, I, yes, but I want the behaviors also kind of matching. As you go down, you see a nice light background of some kind, and when it's selected, it turns a color. I kind of want this style of a, Dropbox. So I, I don't want you using the default version that Windows or the Mac gives you. So um, it, the reason, styled I, select I, 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 the reason it, the, I can't like give you full carte blanche because I don't want then, you know, when the TA deducts points to say, it's kind of hard to know without my looking at your interface exactly what what you mean by how different it is. So um, that's kind of something where if you could maybe do a Piazza post or come and see me in office hours, I can be a little more concrete if I see your interfaces to whether I feel like it's really diverging from the spirit of what I've done. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So let me actually, I did get a little off track. I want to show you also how to turn this drop down uh, box into something with an arrow. At least on my Mac, the way you can do that is wrap the menu in a div. So here's my select menu right here. It's just a bunch of cars. Okay. And if I take away, I'm going to take away this div for a moment. I actually wrote it, okay. And I am going to, and you see it just appears as the way a Mac would display it, okay? But if I wrap it in a div, like this, it changes to this drop-down arrow. Now I did some other things in addition to that div. So if you come up here, um, you can see that I called the div custom select. So I um, set the background color for that uh, um, select for that um, for the select to be white. In fact, these two are doing the same thing. I think let me just get rid of this for a moment. This works. Okay, that does not work. It goes back to being that. Ah, that's because that's not a actual select tag. Let me change that to an actual select tag. Again. There we go. So all I did was then I changed the select tag, see if I can get away with not changing the background color. I cannot get away. See, I have to change the background color. So I changed the background color to white. 
Dr. BBZ, I have a quick question. Yep, just a just sec, let me finish this, okay? And yeah, then yeah. I'll take it. So by changing the background color to white and embedding that select um, thing in the div, I was able to um, control the, to, to change it to this arrow. And then I did some other things like I fiddled with the width and the height to make it more closely approximate what you see here. And I just wanted to say you can do further things. So you could, um, let's say I set the border to be zero, meaning no border. And then this is going to get a little hairier. Um, See, I can now change the border. You, you don't have to do this, but I am just showing how you can do some of this. I could make it round it. And for some reason, it seems if I just do it um, instead down here, for some reason, it doesn't seem at least when I was playing with it earlier, it worked. Okay, so it may be that you can change the border there too. Yep, it looks like, okay. So you can also just play with changing the border, changing the radius. I, that's not part of it. I just wanted to show how you could do that um, without, uh, doing a lot of fancy footwork because I went back, looked at some of the assignments from last spring and people were doing a lot of fancy stuff to try to make um, this drop down menu look like this. And you can see even on this project, they were missing the down arrow. And it turned out it's just, it's really a fairly simple thing to convert it. You just, as I say, you embed the select element inside a div Right here, here's the select element embedded inside a div. And then it seems to work with changing uh, width, height, everything seems to work from there. Okay, just make sure you set the background color to white. Otherwise, it still stays with the default look and feel. Okay, questions. Now, someone so, had a time. Yeah, I had a quick question. So I'm testing on Windows, and that's really all I have access to. I don't have a Mac or right. anything. So and I'm testing on Firefox. If say there's like when you all load it up on a Mac and there's some OS override that I don't know of on Mac that misses with my CSS some, will I be like docked for that or probably and then just send me some email and say okay. and show me the screenshot, okay? Sounds good. Because it may well be that I don't know which actually laptop Faskar has. He's the one grading it. He may have a Windows laptop for all I know. And it can get browser specific too. He might be using Chrome on Windows and you're using Firefox on the Mac. So you sometimes can get those um, both OS dependencies and browser dependencies. So right, yeah. if it comes out, you get points taken off, but your thing shows it right just um, actually, the easiest thing to do first is send Bascar a screenshot, let him know, and if you don't get satisfaction, then we can talk, okay? Sounds good. Thank you. Welcome. Other questions? Okay. I can add so, some okay. context for why that background color works. Okay. Can you? Thank you. I'm not, because I have to admit, I was just blindly experimenting. Yeah. The uh, browser adds the, the default arrows that were there with the blue with the white up and down arrows. Mm -hmm. That's added by the browser using a background image on the thing. Okay. When you override the background properties, it it overrides their provided. Ah, uh -huh. and so then it fell back to a default. So how can yeah. it go back to a default arrow down like that? Do you know? That's that, like that the surprise. That's like the right. default elements of the select. So it's different than the background of the select. It's like a actual 
sort of element inside the select. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. And actually, so, uh, can I take away just a sec? I want to see if I can now take away that div because it seemed like I needed that div as well. It, for some reason, that seemed like magic sauce. Um, well, maybe I didn't need that div. Maybe that's is just changing that background color. Might have been done the whole trick. Okay, thanks for the um, context. I appreciate that. Other other questions or context. So, the video shows no down arrow, but you want a down arrow. Yes. So this is the I, I had to pick a project to demo. And this was the best project. This was the one flaw was it was missing the um, arrow. If you go okay if you it without an arrow, don't worry about it. What if our arrow doesn't have gray on it? <laughs> that's okay. Okay. Okay, that's fine. It sounds like we should just not worry too much about styling it. That like just let the browser style it for the most part, right? Yes, that's right. Basically. Um, as long as you set, I think, the background color to white, I think you'll get pretty much the styling you need. Other than it looked a little small, I, I'd like you to punch up the size a little bit. Um, if you use the default font size, it comes up looking a little uh, cramped, in my opinion. So that's regular select. Pardon? And I was able to style it. I, I changed the font family. Basically, font size, um, maybe pump it up a little bit, let's say 150%. That was, to me, the biggest. Otherwise, it comes out looking, you know, play with it a little. It just seemed too small um, at, a, at the normal um, size. It's, I hate to say it, for my aging eyes, This is a little hard to read. So just a little bigger than that. And you can see here, it's a little bigger than that too. I think it's like a 16 point font maybe. Um, Dr. VZ, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, I, I, I'm a, sorry if I missed this. Why did you, why did you feel uh, that, it, that we had to put the select in the div? Because I was able to style just that, regular that's old what I just, um, I. I just actually did it myself. I just took away the div and it worked. So oh, it might have been oh, that okay. the secret sauce was changing the background color to white. And it just may have been that. I, I took this originally from uh, the W3 Schools website where they created a custom drop down menu and they had wrapped it in the div. So I think what happened was I wrapped it in the div turned the background color to white and didn't realize that the magic sauce was turning the background color to white. I thought it was embedding it in a div, but it doesn't look that way because I just removed the div as well and it was still working. Okay, I thought that was crucial for something that I wasn't seeing, so I thought I'd ask um, again. I thought okay. it was, but it appears not to be. Okay, whereas I do think it's more crucial um, on this link when you're dealing with this link, I think you are going to have to embed them in divs so that they stretch across the nav bar. So there, I think you will, to get it to stretch all the way like this, I think you'll have to embed it in a div. Some of you who are more- You know, I, I think the grid box kind of handles it for you okay. a little bit. If, if you it, stick if something does, in a grid box, okay. it just fills it. Okay, if it does, it does, great. So, um, I, as I say, I, for me, it's also trial and error. I, I, I will confess to normally using Bootstrap. And uh, that's why the style looks like Bootstrap for those of you who know it. So I myself am guilty of not um, always doing stuff at the kind of base level of CSS. So I'm reduced to some experimentation just like you all. So. That's how I could make it work, but maybe the grid layout makes it work perfectly anyhow. Okay, actually, I have one, small oh, one final question, then I really need to move on. So um, I know for the select, we use uh, like the drop, we, for the drop down menu on the left, we use a select. If 
For the drop down menu in the top right, though, where there's the like uh, little person icon and the arrow, would that be like uh, the more complex like JavaScript drop down menu or select as well? Um, let me check after class how I had done that. I think you can still get away with using a select for that. But I must admit, I'm not 100% positive. Okay. I just so. remember in the video, it seemed like it had some styling on the actual select options. I'm not, I wasn't aware of how to do that. Um, so I figured it required maybe JavaScript. I didn't implement that. <laughs> it, it, it actually doesn't. I was able to accomplish it with A links or whatever. And I made it, you had to use positioning and like absolute. And, you had, and then you had to shift those. Display was none, so they would disappear. But when you clicked on it for focus, the display became a block, and that was the only change. And then you shifted where that list was. Okay. And so because because the position is absolute, it stays with that element no matter where it is on the page. And that's how you keep it locked okay. in. I had to figure this out through another website. Okay. I For this assignment, you don't need that behavior. That's for Web Project 4. Okay, okay, awesome. I thought it might be like that, but I just wanted to check in case. <laughs> okay. Um, I will check. Oh, crap. What a look to the person that. who just uh, spoke up, I can't actually see it. Could you maybe make a Piazza post where you just explain in general terms, not, you know, a specific recipe, but if you could give like a general um, set of instructions for how you did it, I think that would be helpful. Okay, yeah, I'll make that post. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, if you have other questions, I can handle them after class because um, I did know that I probably didn't have a full lecture today, but now I'm down to 45 minutes. So I'm pretty sure I now have a full lecture. Um, so what I wanted to cover was PHP form handling and uh, uh, session management. So, the just a quick uh, review of um, HTML forms. So you have a bunch of basically, uh, let's actually look at a form. I'm going to actually log in. Okay, so quick review of forms. So you have an action which has a URL. You have a method for how you post. Then you have a number of input elements and the important things are the name and the value because that's how um, they get transmitted as key value pairs to the PHP script. So. The name will be the uh, key. The value will be whatever value gets transmitted. And typically you have a submit button of some type. And when that submit button is hit, then uh, the browser packages up those uh, name value pairs into um, some kind of encoding that's dictated by something called the common gateway interface, uh, CGI. So, common And I'm not a big like plumbing uh, of the infrastructure or how the plumbing is done for uh, web servers. I understand that CGI is pretty much outdated at this point and been superseded by other technologies, but the way the encoding used to transmit those key value pairs is still the one that was specified by the 
CGI standard. So um, when my notes say, talk about the common gateway interface, it's mostly with regards to how these name value pairs get packaged up and sent to the servers. You don't have to worry about it. Um, how that happens, you can just assume it happens. Then on the server side, they get put into either a dollar sign underscore get or a dollar sign underscore post array, depending on which a method you use to do the transmission. So now if I want it to get this number, I would say dollar sign underscore get number and it would return the form information associated with numbers. So for example, if I had selected show top 20, it would actually return 20 because that's its value. So I would actually get 20 for number in the PHP script. So that is how the form data gets submitted to your PHP script. Now there's a few things you have to worry about then once it's been uh, transmitted. So the, let's see. Okay, uh, first thing you'll notice here, you could have multiple options and that comes in as an array. So, uh, if I did a selection for um, top from get, then I would get an array because there are, it's indicated that multiple selections are allowed. And even if there's only one selection, it will still come in as an array. Also, you may remember last time I was talking about how you simulate um, the submission of form data. So just once again, the way that you do that is with the program PHP-CGI, which is, may not be available on your local machines, but is available on the Hydra Labs. So again, it's PHP-CGI-CGI, then the name of your script, and then whatever, um, your name value pairs need to be. So for example, you might say comments equals hybrid. You might say quantity equals 10. Notice you don't need quotes if you're not, if you don't have white space in there. And then if you want to have arrays, you can do that by putting the arrays in the name of the arrays, whoops. Ugh, what just happened? Something went way off, huh, way off, okay. So we'll do it again. If you, you want to specify something for arrays, you put the array name with the empty braces in quotes like that, give it the value, so equals, Hard working. Then again, gosh darn it. Keep hitting the wrong, I keep hitting return and it keeps. Okay, again in quotes, and you'd say smart. So by doing this, it's going to put two array entries for quals, the first one being hardworking, the second one being smart. So this is how um, you can simulate uh, an array with form data. Okay, now again, this is the, it will show up in dollar sign underscore get. You can't simulate a post method using this uh, 
function, but at least you can simulate getting form data and working with form data. And then when it's working, if you're using post, just change your get to a post. Okay, so that will allow you to experiment with using form data at the command line. Remember, I think it's a lot easier to generally work at the command line first and only when it's working, then move it to web home. Okay. Um, so next is there's a couple useful methods for checking your form data. So the first one is is set. Okay, so there is a command called is set. And then you give it a variable name and it will uh, indicate whether or not that variable is or that key is um, defined or that variable is defined. So in your thing, you can do something like is set underscore dollar sign get age. And this is going to return true if the um, variable has a value, which can include zero or the um, D or an empty string. So returns true. If variable is defined. Okay, um, and we'll work Okay, unfortunately, this can be a little bit of a pain in the neck for a text box because you may be wanting to guarantee that there's some, that text box returns a non empty string. So the second useful function is empty. Same thing, it can, it takes any variable, including a dictionary post. And what it's going to do is it returns true if the variable is zero or an empty string. So that can be useful because, as I said, if a text box returns an empty string, that variable is still defined. Now, that is not the case with radio buttons or checkboxes. If, for example, in this, let me actually go back to here, if I don't check, any of the checkboxes, then top will not appear in the submitted form data. And if I do an is set on top, it will return false. So it often makes sense to check to make sure that your form data is actually defined before you go and access the key. Because if you go and access the key and it's not there, PHP could give you a syntax error, or not a syntax, a runtime error, a key not defined error, and your script would fail. So these two functions um, is set to ensure that a piece of form data is there like you expect, and this empty to check if you have an empty string can be useful. So as far as I know, 
it's only check boxes. Um, I think selects, select menus, anything with a choice. If that choice is not present, then that name value pair may be omitted from the form data that gets submitted. So that's why you'd use is set. So another thing then you have to be concerned about when the user provides a string is if they submit things that have special characters. So for example, let's say, Okay, so here's a very simple form. It's a text box. I'm going to enter some information. I'm going to echo it back out. So, hi, Brad. Submit query. The result is hi, Brad. Okay, now I'm going to add some special characters. Hi, Brad. How are you? And I submit the query. Something went wrong. All I got back was high, okay? The problem is this double quote right here. It's a special character, okay? And that's causing issues. Here's another one. A href equals um, download virus.com sort by date, submit query. Okay, that one got cut off. Um, just trying to do a cross, not sure what, oh, that's, oh no, the same thing. Um, that's that, messed it up. That uh, quote was in there, but notice how badly it got messed up. This is actually, coming after the text box here. So it really messed it up, okay? So if we look at what's going on, I'll, all I'm doing is with the form, I'm taking what I get and I'm just blindly putting it back into comments. Well, you'll notice I'm interpolating. So I have value equals this double quote. And then dollar sign underscore get, what happens is when I put a quote here like, hi, Brad, this double quote right here prematurely terminates this value statement right here. So that means that as soon as it sees this first double quote, it thinks, ah, I've reached the end of the string. So that is what high is. And then this Brad that's left, whoops. Is free to do mischief. Okay, so in this case, uh, when I submit it, it just ate it. But in the other case, it somehow managed to trick the um, resulting PHP script into thinking that something went beyond the text box. Somehow the, um, it, it, it actually added text beyond here. So you need to be able to deal with special characters like double quotes. And the way you do that is there is a function called HTML entities. That will replace all of these special characters with their corresponding entity code. So now if I do it, you get the full result. Okay, if we look at exactly what's going on. Let's run it using the CGI.
you can see that what it's actually sending back, it can that HTML entities convert it to special characters like double quotes to an entity code. And that's what ended up getting sent back to the browser. And that's why it showed up the way it did here. Okay, so HTML entities is one way that you can strip these um, characters that could otherwise cause you problems. So there's a couple other examples I have of that. Let's uh, take a look. So we haven't gotten to it yet, but the way that we submit queries to the SQL uh, server in PHP is with the command mysql underscore query. And the same problem can happen, insert into code value. So here, um, what I'm thinking is that I am submitting some C++ code which again could have double quotes in them. So the problem is when I insert into code values, if the code has double quotes in it, then it will prematurely terminate the string that started right here. So again, you can end up with um, your script crashing or if a hacker is attacking your server and the hacker knows something about your script, the hacker might actually be able to start executing other commands by getting this dollar sign underscore get code to terminate the string early. And then what's after the double quotes could be valid script commands or something that could actually result in an attack against your database server. So um, you need to be, it's called, I believe an injection attack. I'm not a security person, but I think it's called an injection attack where you attack knowing that by terminating early this double quote, you can then get your own commands executed instead. Okay, and then the final one example is something called a cross site scripting attack, which I believe I had in the notes. So let's go to the notes. Okay, so here's an example of something called a cross-site scripting attack, where you're basically um, a hacker enters something into a form, and that um, information is used to trick another user of this site. So a cross-site is called a cross-site hacking attack. Um, it's what's it called? X, yep, XSS is the acronym for it. And here's an example. Let's say we have uh, a site for blog posts, and a hacker enters this particular um, blog post. So, it, um, link href equals on click equals document dot location dot href equals dollar www.downloadvirus.com, and then sort post by date. So the problem is if you simply echo back what the hacker entered into the form, this will appear as a link. And when the user clicks on it, this JavaScript statement will be executed. And 
we haven't talked about the document object model yet for how a page is represented in memory. But just suffice it to say that what this does is it points the browser to a new page. And presumably that new page is downloading a virus. Okay. So you want to stop this kind of attack. And that means you can't just blindly echo back whatever um, information you get from the form. And again, the way you stop it is with the HTML entities function, which will convert all tags. So not only does it convert things like double quotes to their entity tags, it also converts any tag, anything that starts with a less than, some text and a greater than, it will convert it instead to, I'm sorry, it's not anything. It will convert less than signs to their entity codes, greater than signs to their entity codes. It will convert ampersands to their entity codes. There's a bunch of special characters that will convert to their entity codes. So this one right here will get converted to this string by HTML entity. So you'll notice the less than was replaced by its entity code. Uh, the double quotes were replaced with an entity code. Um, here, this href equals this single quote right here got replaced with a entity code. Um, and then down here, the closing quotes, oops, closing quotes were also replaced with entity codes. So when this page gets rendered, we can actually try rendering this and see what gets rendered. So you see, it basically looks like what the hacker entered because all of those entity codes now get rendered like the um, ampersand LT semicolon gets rendered as a less than sign. The uh, ampersand QUOT semicolon gets rendered as a double quote. But notice this is not appearing as a link. Instead, the, what the hacker tried to do is revealed. Okay, so you need to be careful about, it's called sanitizing your data. This is called sanitizing the data. And it means basically um, stripping or, and or converting special characters to entity codes to stop them from affecting your program adversely. Okay, and the big one for that is HTML entities. That's your uh, number one, one that you end up using to do. There's a couple other ones that are nice. So uh, so strip slash, I'm sorry. Um, Ah, I'm going to have to go back to my notes. So if I go back to my PHP basics and Brad's Cliff's notes, I had useful functions. So strip tags will actually physically strip out HTML and PHP tags. So they actually get eliminated as opposed to the entity codes being changed. Um, hang on, where is HTML entities?
Not there. Is it here? There we go. Okay, so other things, commands, add slashes will replace single quotes, double quotes, and backslashes with their escaped equivalent. So if you call add slashes, a single quote will be replaced with a backslash quote. A double quote will be replaced with a backslash quote. So you can use that if you want to insert a string into um, database. Remember that code example I gave you where you were reading in C++ code from a form, you could call add slashes on that code element and it would backslash all of the double quotes and take care of the problem. HTML entities tends to be my go-to function for um, sanitizing data and then you can decode it. That is, you can get the original string back by calling HTML entity decode, which will replace all the entity codes with the actual characters. So um, it turns out that you certainly wouldn't want to do that with a cross-site um, hacking attack. You want to uh, sanitize that string I showed you with the link, but with code that you're sending back, you don't want the double quotes to be either ampersand escaped or with a backslash in front of them. So if you had changed your C++ code using HTML entities, when you served it back, you would want to call HTML entity decode or you would want to call uh, strip slashes if you had originally added slashes to the double quotes. So, there are ways of reversing actions that you sometimes take. Okay, and then another useful function that I sometimes use, new line to BR, it replaces all backslash ends with the um, uh, break tag. So sometimes you've output stuff using backslash n, which we know doesn't work in a browser, and NL to BR will replace all new line characters with the BR tag. So I find some of those functions to be helpful. You should always be careful to sanitize your data, even if the form has already type checked the data. The problem is hackers can um, get into the middle, so to speak. So when you transmit, data from the client hackers can attack right here even with post hackers can attack i'm not a hacker i'm not sure how it's done i just know that there are ways that hackers can insert themselves right here and spoof form data so that what you're getting is not something sent from uh, the form that you sent to a client and that type check the form data, but instead what you're getting is something that hackers are sending you, which has not been type checked by your form data. So even if you do type checking on the client side, you can't guarantee that the data coming in on the server side is clean. So you must always treat whatever you receive on the server side suspiciously and redo any type checking that was done on the client side. So any type checking done on the client side is just for the benefit of the user to stop them from entering bad data. You have to redo those checks on the server side um, to avoid having hackers uh, either tamper with the data or uh, say with a get post, remember with get, they can actually send in their own URL. So even if it's not malicious, someone could bypass the form, 
simply submit their own URL with its encoded data, and you can't be sure that the data you're getting has been type checked. Okay, so things to just be careful about. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, for specifically against SQL injection attacks, isn't it good practice to also use prepared statements? Yes. So when we get to um, SQL on Thursday, I'm going to talk about prepared statements. And in fact, in your um, web project three, I want you to use prepared statements. I don't want you to use that command I just showed you. <laughs> I was just trying to show you that it, the reason that they introduced prepared statements were, as you say, to stop those injection attacks. And also, quite frankly, just to stop stupid um, mistakes on the part of people um, getting form data in and not realizing how that form data could mess them up. So yes, definitely for Web Project 3, I think it's even in there, it says you have to use prepared statements. Other questions or comments? Okay, so our next topic is session management. So you all are used to working with programs where variables maintain their values for the lifetime of a program. Well, you're still dealing with um, variables that maintain their values for the lifetime of the program, but that script is executed once and then it terminates and all values are lost. So for example, let's say I have a pizza example. Uh, uh, didn't want that. Need to find a sec. There we go. Okay, so we have a form. Pick your toppings. So that's pepperoni and mushrooms, your favorite color, purple. Show all, you already saw this form. Okay, so earlier I showed you this form. Okay, and it calls this PHP method right here, pizza session.php. So when I send the form, that PHP session generates this right here. Okay, notice it's missing my pizza toppings, number equals 20. So if we look at that script, okay, so I'm going to have to fix the fact that the toppings didn't come out properly. But you can see it says for each topping, it's supposed to print it. It echoes out um, my favorite color. It echoes out number. And then it echoes out another form with the action php session one dot php type um, equals submit value equals press to reconfirm. Okay, and the problem is that this dollar sign get stuff is lost. 
when the script ends. It no longer is defined. But we want that information to be available to this script right here. So the way we can do that is with the command called session start. So what that does, if you already have a session started, you now get access to this array that is carried or available between different web pages. Okay, so if this one has already been set up by a previous script, you have access to whatever it's set. If this is the first time that it is called in this interaction, then it establishes this dollar sign underscore session array. And it also creates what is called a session ID. That's it. So the session ID is sent as a cookie to the client. We haven't yet talked about cookies. But it's used to um, retrieve the underscore session table for subsequent interactions with the client. So cookies are data that is then resent back from the client to the server with every script. So with every invocation of a uh, URL, the cookie data is bound up and sent back to the script. So that SID gets sent back, it's preserved. And the first thing that happens with session start is it checks if the SID already exists, it uses it to find this dollar sign underscore session table. If it doesn't exist, it creates a new dollar sign underscore session table and a new SID and ships it out to the client. So here you can see the first thing I did after calling session start was I actually saved the form data into the session variable. So that then when I end up calling this PHP session one dot PHP, and calling session start, I can now access the form data that I saved. Okay, so when I hit my press to reconfirm, it was still favorite color purple, number equals 20. As I said, I have to figure out why um, the toppings is broken. But the dollar sign underscore session table is basically the way that you save data between different scripts because you are no longer running a monolithic program on the back end. Instead, you are running a series of independent scripts that are each in a different file and hence are a different program. So what you're having to do is find a way to share information between these independent programs. And the way you do it is with session management. So on Thursday, I will continue this discussion of session management. There turns out that this is the most common way to handle session management, but cookies, hidden form data, and um, database management of the session information can also 
uh, be used to do session management. So um, we will get to the remaining uh, part of session management on Thursday. And I will figure out why my toppings were not coming out here and I will get that fixed. Um, and with that, I will let you go. I will see you all Thursday. Reminder, I have office hours starting today around 2.35, going till 3.45. I'm also available here for a few minutes if you have immediate questions. So with that, I will see you all on Thursday and let you go.